Welcome to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson, Certified Financial Planner and Managing Director of Polaris Capital Advisors. We'll be joined later in the show by Todd McGarity, Equity Portfolio Strategist at Polaris, to discuss the ever-elusive topic of yield, something that everybody is trying to find these days and unable to. So we're going to address that later on in the show, some different opportunities for finding yield in this low interest rate market. But before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on market-wise, because we certainly have had a really busy couple of weeks. Um, specifically, of course, what's in the forefront is still Europe. Um, as of filming today, which is Tuesday, September 27th, we're seeing that there, there are some solutions that are coming to the forefront. We don't know concretely yet what those solutions are, but just the expectation that there is going to be a resolution is definitely driving the markets up. We've seen a 3 to 4 percent rise just in the last two days. Uh, of course, that's following a very tumultuous uh, couple of weeks. Last week was a historically negative week. Um, so it was somewhat expected that the market was oversold and we would see a rebound, but today it's largely being driven by the expectation of some kind of a resolution in Europe. You have to couple that, though, with some unrest here in the United States. We have seen a, uh, a reduction in what the GDP or the economic growth rate is supposed to be here in the United States. It was lowered from an expectation of 3 percent down to about 1.5 percent, so cut in half, and that's actually following in the difficult 2008-09 years where we expected that we'd have quicker growth following those kinds of those kinds of bear markets and that type of recessionary environment. So that's somewhat negative news and you have to couple that of course with the fact that we have a US debt situation or deficit scenario that will have to be solved by November. And I think that those things are definitely creating a lot of volatility, a lot of unrest in the market. It's great to see some positive news coming out of Europe. But when we couple that with the unrest here in the United States, I still it's definitely driving uh, volatility and unrest and fear in the market up. If you want to measure that by a market index, there's actually an index called the VIX, which we've addressed before, also called the fear index or the volatility index. That's actually double where it was the beginning of August. So you can see what, um, you know, what that's done to the market and what that's probably done to some of your portfolios over the last two months. So lots going on. Um, specifically, though, some of the biggest news of the last week was the twist, and that, of course, was the Fed's uh, latest uh, attempt to, to buoy the, uh, the, the economy. And what they're doing and what they suggested that they're going to do beginning in the next month or so is they're going to buy $400 billion worth of, tre of Treasury securities at the long end of the curve between the six-year and the 30-year maturity. The purpose of doing that is to try to keep interest rates artificially low to motivate investment and you know, hopefully motivate some kind of economic growth. Um, the market, of course, did not see that uh, in very positive light and sold off pretty precipitously after that announcement. Nonetheless, uh, we do expect that interest rates will remain uh, artificially low for the foreseeable future, which creates a challenge for investors that are looking for some kind of yield in their portfolio, whether it be interest rate yield, dividend yield, etc. So we're going to address some of those challenges that the twist is going to create for that investor um, and try to hopefully uh, create some solutions for you as far as where you might be able to find some yield in this difficult and low interest rate environment. So please stick with us. We'll be right back. This is Money Matters, and I'm Emily Johnson. Hello, this is David Kroll from Mortgage Network. I'd like to touch on the, on the subject of fear today and what it does to our decision making. Uh, think about the following two perspectives. Uh, a couple trying to sell their home and beset by today's market. Uh, no one's come to look at it. No one's made an offer on it. And uh, their neighbor just sold for 35% below list price. The alternative is the couple next door down who just got a mortgage at 4 and an eighth percent and whose payment for their existing home went down $350 a month. Those are essentially same folks, same street, and all that separates them is perspective and timing. The message today is to look closely at your plans, to look closely at your timing, to look closely at what you must have and must do. Thank you very much.
Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson and I am joined by Todd McGarity, Equity Portfolio Strategist at Polaris Capital Advisors. And today we want to talk to you a little bit about first what's going on with the twist and also what that has to do for investors who are looking for yield, what the impact is. So let's get started with the twist. Uh, mm -hmm. So my understanding of the twist is that the Fed is purchasing $400 billion worth of long-term securities uh, in an attempt to keep the uh, to keep yields low at the long end of the curve, sort of the 2030. I guess they're saying between six and 30, right. um, you know, year end of the of the yield curve. So, tell me a little bit about the impact um, that that's going to have on the yield curve, and what sort of the impact has been on stocks as they announced it. Well, I think the goal is obviously to to push uh, long term rates lower to try to stimulate the economy. More, uh, more on the financing from from longer term, keeping longer term rates low. But aren't they already low? I mean, they, aren't we? We are, are historically low, low levels already. They are, and to a large degree, a lot of people think you're somewhat, you know, pushing on a string, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, as far as a, an effect on the economy, a lot of people believe that it's going to have very limited impact. Mm -hmm. Um, I know this has been done before. I mean, it's named the twist because when they did it first, it was 1961, and it came out just after Chevy Checker's song. So it was done before, and I think they showed then that it had a, a minimal impact. Very it marginal. Did have some, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you know, the negatives. There are some negatives to consider with it. Um, not only uh, not only does it hurt the bank's earnings, but it it actually freezes the capital. Hurts from the, the bank's the, earnings because they don't have that spread, that margin that they. That's can, right. You know. you know, banks make money obviously between you know between taking money in, paying mm -hmm. low rates on the you know on the short term, and then loan it out at much More higher expensive. rates. Mm -hmm. And that spread is how uh, how banks make money. Mm -hmm. And that, that in, entices banks, you know, with a steep lend. yield curve and higher long term <clears> rates, <throat> it entices you know, banks to lend. Mm -hmm. And when you take that, that earnings power away from them, they tend to do uh, fewer loans, which mm -hmm. is it's, which is already a problem. Which is pretty right much now. the pretty much the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. Right. I think, you know, the main reason for uh, for the Fed doing this is to um, I believe send the message that they're gonna keep rates longer or lower for longer, longer and uh, to stimulate the economy that way. The market sold off, even though that was the attempt was to stimulate the economy and to show that they're doing something. It was almost as if by doing what they did and showing that that was their not their final hand, but right. one of their final hands, and you know that it wasn't going to move the market much, move the economy much. It was pretty much right. a negative as far as you know the market's I, response. I think the market sees very limited success in that program, and in fact, it actually takes away um, some of the incentives uh, for banks to unlock the capital that's so desperately, you know, needed right. for uh, for economic growth. So I think uh, I think what the market's telling you is the, um, they're not a big fan of that uh, of that mm -hmm. policy. So that said, I mean, that, that's sort of the biggest news that's occurred over the last week or so, that the, well, that and, of course, everything going on in Europe. But the impact of that twist and, and just interest rates in general, interest rates are historically very, very low right now. They're lower than they've been, I think, was it even back in World War II That's or right. So? You've got to go way back to find uh, even 10-year rates right now, which is um, kind of a benchmark to, to how to measure that, that mm -hmm. smallest gap of money. Right, or below 2% for the first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we saw them get um, in the... The panic that we saw the other day, um, when when fear was uh, running rampant in the market, we saw them actually get to, I believe it was one one point six. Mm -hmm. So um, that that is and historically interestingly, when low. it's inflation adjusted, that then makes them negative. That's right. That's a negative so, real rate. You know, at that point. At ten years, mm -hmm. so you give your money to somebody, and then ten years later, get back less. Right. Fantastic. Right. So <laughs> well, I guess that bodes the question for a lot of our you know for a lot of our clients and for a lot of investors out there that are looking for yield. I mean, we have people coming to us all the time saying, what is it that we can do to get some kind of some kind of yield above 0.0012% on our savings or above the 0.25% you know, that they're getting on a three-year CD, right. um, you know, but still have some kind of a yield, but without taking too much risk, which is always the, you know, the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, and now that we have interest rates being forced to stay low on the long end of the curve, and they're already you know, extremely low on the short end of the curve, Mm -hmm. um, you know what? What are some of the opportunities that are available for investors out there looking for yield? And it's a conversation you and I have all the right. time. Right. So I, you know, I don't know where we should start, but I know we have several different um, you know solutions that we have for that. If, if you you know if you will, uh, but one thing that you and I always have to go back and forth on is the difference between or the the conundrum that we have between yield, just getting a higher rate of return, and the risk that goes along with that. And that's one thing that I think a lot of you know, a lot of investors don't necessarily understand. They'll look at you know some a bond say that's yielding eight percent and not realize that perhaps there's a lot of risk involved 
with that yield. Right. Well, a lot depends on a, on a as you know, on a client specific uh, mm -hmm. you know case anyway. Um, because it depends on how much they need that yield, how much income do they need, how stable right. do they need that income, or do they just prefer to have some income to offset expense. Right. So um, a lot of that depends on, you know, on the type of income that they need and the type of client need um, right. that you have. So, it, you know, to me, I prefer, um, you know, in this sort of uh, situation when you've had rates pushed down on a artificial basis by the Fed anyway, mm -hmm. um, you pretty much know where the next move in rates is, is heading. Well, you would expect that it's going to be going up, for right. sure, but you know, you have, like you said, there are a couple of different kinds of investors. You've got the investor that solely relies on the income that comes from, say, their bond portfolio mm -hmm. or even their stock portfolio. You have the investor that's looking for total return and that they want yield on their or, you know, income right. as well as some kind of growth presumably, right. so that's the total return investor, and then you have your growth-oriented investor who's less concerned right. about yield at this point. So really, our focus would be in this discussion, it would probably just be on the, the investor that's looking for income. Well, I, th I, think the, I think the sweet spot right now, let me just say that, mm -hmm. um, that uh, the sweet spot right now, in my opinion, is, is a growth with an income bias, mm -hmm. um, and the reason is, is because you know, you've had equity prices essentially price in what you know, could be a possible, you know, recession type scenario. So we've already kind of priced in a worst case scenario, especially right. with the European crisis Certainly going on. Certainly over the last two months. Right. Yeah. So you've got compressed equity prices and you also have artificially compressed rates. Mm -hmm. um, so right now you get that scramble for yield, but we're also seeing, you know, equity prices so low right. that some of the dividend payers out there, the high quality, you know, large cap blue chip type names are looking attractive. Are paying uh, dividends that are historically from a percentage, you know, return, you know, basis are and historically than high. That's exactly right. But yeah. we still get, you know, you still get a, a growth bias. Um, of the underlying story of an improving economy, which mm -hmm. um, you know, you're just not going to get chasing a pure dividend play or a right. pure you know, yield play. Well, let's, let's stop on that just for a second, and we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to discuss a couple of different ideas that we have for yield in this kind of an environment, this low interest rate environment. And mm -hmm. I look forward to discussing that with you in just a second. We'll be right back. This is Money Matters. <laughs> Back to Money Matters. I'm again joined by Todd McGarity, and we started the show talking about the twist and how the twist is artificially keeping interest rates low. Now we want to address how it is that we can try to find yield in this kind of a low interest rate environment. So we're going to go through maybe a half a dozen different ideas very quickly on how we might find yield in this kind of an environment. Um, first and foremost, starting with stocks. And it, before we get started, I should actually uh, just mention a little bit of definition here. When we're looking at yield, we're looking purely at, at dividends and interest. One thing we need to consider, though, when we're looking at yield is what is the risk that's attached to that yield? When you see high yields, it's frequently attached to higher risk. And you also need to look at the quality of the investment that you're investing in. So sometimes you might actually have a, a lower interest rate with a higher quality security, whether it be a stock or a bond. So when you hear us discussing those things, just please keep those relationships in mind. So first and foremost, again, uh, not to take any time away from our discussion here, but mm. talking about uh, high dividend yielding stocks, so typically value-oriented blue chip type stocks. I know there's been a lot of money flowing to those over the last two months. Um, right. Why is that and you know what are you recommending to people as far as the yield that you're seeing, et cetera, in, in high yield stocks? Well I think um, I think you do have to be careful as an investor before you, you chase yield um, mm -hmm. and yield alone, um, so to so to speak. There is a um, there's a hunger right now for yield because sure. basically um, fixed, you know, long term investments, um, you know, Treasury uh, Treasury yields are, you know, historically low based on right, the fact the, that they... The mattress they, is looking better and better, That's actually. right. <laughs> and, um, you know, what's amazing is you just, you just, uh, you're seeing rates just go lower and lower, and it's, um, people are scrambling for a place to have some sort of income. Mm -hmm. really puts a, a pretty tough squeeze on not only the banks, which we talked about uh, mm -hmm. in our last segment, but also... Um, also puts a squeeze on people who save, right? Um, and you know, older people that re that re rely, rely on, that, on income. that income to right. survive. 
Um, so um, it makes it really difficult on, uh, on seniors who depend on that income. So when they see their income go down from 4% of their portfolio to 2% of their portfolio, they're going to be looking for another opportunity and they might look to high dividend yielding stocks, right. the, the GEs to. of the world, the IBMs. The, right. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to look um, for some people who are uncomfortable um, in stocks. You know, at the same time, they're seeing rates being pushed down to that low. They see their yield cut on what their normal uh, portfolio uh, yield is, mm -hmm. and their income that they rely on is, is cut, mm -hmm. uh, in some cases in half, um, at that point, um, you know, they're, they're nervous to chase stocks because at the same time they're seeing the equity market right. in a panic type mode, right. um, and they're seeing uh, equity prices go even lower. So at that point, it, it's, it's a very difficult proposition mm -hmm. um, to say, hey, I'm just going to go out and and uh, you know, and buy some high quality, you know, dividend yielding stocks. But that said, from a total return perspective, which is the the growth in the underlying stock, let's say you buy a stock at ten dollars and it goes to twelve dollars, you've got growth of two dollars in there. Right. And then let's say there's also a dollar dividend. Mm -hmm. You add those two together, that three dollars is your total return. So for a total return investor, maybe somebody who's not just looking for income from the yield. And somebody younger that, that has a longer time horizon mm -hmm. that, um, you know, has, that a little is, bit more appetite for has earning stomach. years left. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who's, uh, somebody's in that, uh, that bracket, it, it really, um, you know, it really is a great time to be looking at some of these mm -hmm. because, the, because the, the dividend part of that return is so high right now, which uh, tells you the price is, you know, it's pretty, pretty inexpensive. Right. right? So, okay, so now we've, we've covered equities. Let's talk specifically about utilities within. That's one that, you know, I commonly hear uh, from investors is, you mm. know, what about utilities right now? I see, you know, utilities with 6% yield. Thoughts? Well, okay. utilities, uh, utilities are a great choice. They're the traditional uh, go-to play um, when you are looking for yield. They offer uh, a little less volatility. Mm -hmm. um, you do have to be careful in following the herd into, uh, right. you know, into a utility type like portfolio. Like everything else. Right. Sort of um, contrarian indicators. When everybody's buying up and they buy, they're buying that price up, generally if you've got a 6% yield, um, if you're in a rising rate environment, those, uh, those stocks tend to be, as the economy improves and, and long rates start to move up, the money tends to flow from those stocks back into growth. So there's a flight to safety when the fear is right. there, when equity markets go down, when interest rates go down, but then as interest rates go right. back up, money flows back out yep. to what the, the safety is. Exactly. Treasuries. Volatility is, is pretty low in, in utilities overall, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in a normal day. But when you've got a mass exodus, uh, you know, from treasuries looking for other yields, sometimes the prices can get, get run up. Mm -hmm. um, so your yield looks attractive on a relative basis. Right. However, if um, if you get a utility yield, yielding uh, six percent, you know, and uh, when the money moves back towards the growth and income type you're side, you lose money on the underlying utility and, you know, right, stock, and you drop six percent in the stock, it doesn't do you much good. So that total it, return concept. Exactly. Yep. So, and we should also, I suppose, point out when it comes to that that you, when you're looking at at each utility, you do have to do some fundamental analysis on it. Has the dividend increased year over year? quarter over quarter, is it expected to? Because we know, as we've seen before, when those dividends do fall off, the, the price of those stocks do tend to plummet. And so. this brings up an important question because I think it's, it's a lot of, uh, or a lot of times people don't do the research that, it's, that is needed in the right. utility purchase. They're buying the big name utilities right. with the largest markets. Sometimes uh, they don't have a great track record of increasing mm -hmm. dividends, and there may not be one on the horizon, which mm -hmm. um, at that point, does the, the equity price, the underlying equity price does not keep up with the, with the overall Market. And I think that brings us to you know a good a good segue to our third um, option, which is closed end funds. Now, closed end funds are similar to mutual funds in that they hold a basket of securities, but they actually trade more like stocks. So unlike a mutual fund that only trades at the end of the day at a specific price, the the asset value of the holdings, closed end funds are actually going to trade throughout the day. Might trade at a premium or a discount. Just like that, you have to do a lot of fundamental analysis on closed end funds as well because it might have a 10 or 11 percent yield, but how they're generating that yield is, you know, sometimes how they're generating a lot the of yield risk. when it's distributed. Um, mm -hmm. It is run like a fund, but mm -hmm. it gives you the liquidity of the stock. That's mm -hmm. the uh, that's the positive of it. But yes, you do have to be mm -hmm. very careful on a closed end fund. And then briefly, let's just get into high. You also have high yield bonds. Mm -hmm. You have uh, you know junk bonds, high yield bonds. Obviously, you're going to have a lot more uh, yield coming from those, right. but then you have the quality issue again. Right. That's not to say that there aren't some hidden gems within that segment. 
Um, but again, it requires a lot of analysis. And well, and which goes you know, back into the diversification issue of, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a yield portfolio, just a lot of people know about diversification in an equity portfolio, but they rarely consider it in a debt portfolio mm -hmm. or a income portfolio, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, you really need a piece of all those yields, to add, right. you know, or, or all those products even, right. to average out a yield that makes sense. Um, and, it, and it makes sense to be scattered across all of them. Right. So we're just going to summarize with the last couple. A few others you might consider might be REITs. For example, real estate investment trusts. You might also consider master limited partnerships. These are a little bit more complex. We're going to hopefully address these in some future shows. Those are some other options for income mm -hmm. that, as you said, would make sense in a diversified portfolio. Um, so hopefully this has been a helpful discussion. Certainly there are opportunities for yield out there, but I think the bottom line is that you really have to do a gut check on how much risk you can take Absolutely. when seeking that yield and also how it fits in with the rest of your portfolio. Yep. So. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time today. Thank and you. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute with the closing of Money Matters. Welcome back to Money Matters. I'm Emily Johnson. I'd like to close with a few parting shots, one in particular, and that is based on the conversation that we've had, I'm sure that you can see that there is absolutely no silver bullet when it comes to yield. You're not going to be able to find high yield without most likely assuming some element of risk that goes with it, and you really need to consider that risk both from a risk tolerance perspective, what you can take as an investor, um, and also you need to consider based on your financial needs and your portfolio and how those various risks fit into your portfolio. So my closing shot is consider dividing your portfolio into three pieces. Uh, whether you're an investor currently looking for income, whether you're one that will need income within the next two to three years, or whether you're still a growth investor not looking to use the funds in your portfolio anytime soon. Look at your portfolio in three buckets. Consider the first bucket as your short-term funds, the amount that you would need to live anywhere from, say, one to three years. If you're an income-based investor, that would probably be more on the three-year end of the curve. If you're a growth-oriented, it would probably be more on the, the low end or the one-year end of that curve. The second bucket is going to be your interest-bearing, your higher-yielding securities. Those higher-yielding securities are then going to drive some cash into the cash bucket, or that, the first bucket that we discussed. As you use those funds to live, the income from the middle bucket will create more cash, hopefully fill that gap. The third bucket, of course, is going to be your growth-oriented bucket. That's where you're going to have a lot of your riskier securities, those that don't necessarily have a high dividend, um, equities, and also your investments that are typically held in tax-qualified accounts, such as Roths, IRAs, 401ks. Those are the funds that you're going to allow to grow that you can assume more risk with. And as, let's say, you deplete your middle bucket, the income-bearing bucket, you can sell securities in your growth-oriented bucket and replace the income so that that income can then generate and replace the cash. So it's a pretty simplistic scenario, but consider doing that when you're, cons when you're looking at what kind of yield you actually need for your portfolio and what amount of risk you want to take. As I said, it's a very simplistic way to look at your portfolio, but it can be very helpful in helping you determine where your portfolio should be allocated, especially in this you know, difficult not only equity market, but also difficult yield um, or interest rate environment. So hopefully that's helpful. That's um, my closing shot for today. More than happy to address that uh, and any of the issues that we've discussed today on the show with you personally. Please give us a call. Please send me uh, any of your ideas. Thank you very much to uh, the viewers who have sent us their questions in the past. Really appreciate it. Definitely uh, gives us a lot of information to flow from. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Our Facebook page is Polaris uh, dash Money Matters, and my email is Emily at PolarisCapitalAdvisors.com. Really look forward to hearing from you. Hope you have a great week, and look forward to seeing you again next week. This has been Money Matters, and I'm Emily Johnson. <music>